excellent. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, Cycle Tone Festival 2022. Um, this is what, maybe the 11th, 12th, 800th, who knows? There have been so many sessions this, this year that we've completely lost count. Um, tonight, you're all here to see uh, Marcus Stitz, uh, more on him in a moment. But before we sort of uh, pile into the, um, the, the meat and potatoes of, of the talk, uh, there's a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, First thing to mention is that we do have live captions enabled. Uh, some people will find that they are automatically on and they're quite hard to switch off. Um, quite easy on a laptop, quite difficult on an iPad. Um, do your best. Um, if uh, you have any questions, uh, please do put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, because the chat box can get quite full and I might miss any questions if, if they're in the chat box. I'll do my best if you put one in there by mistake to to copy and paste it across and, and figure it out, but um, I can't guarantee that. Um, uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah, uh, the Cycle Touring Festival is free uh, while it's online, but your donations do help keep, help keep the wheels turning. Suggested £5 donation per talk per household or £20 for the whole thing. What a bargain. I will put a link in the chat or you can use the powers of our internet search. Excellent. Okay, so um, wow, everyone's already chatting on the the chat. We've got people from, do you know, what, I'm not going to list it. People from all, all over the world, Marcus. Uh, I'm going to give Marcus a very very brief introduction and let him get started. Um, many of you will have heard of Marcus because he is very very present uh, online. Probably became famous initially for riding around the world on a single speed, which is the kind of thing that you just kind of definitely have to be quite committed to do, um, but has since done all kinds of stuff and has written in a lot of very interesting and exciting places, done a whole bunch of uh, adventure races, things like the Highland Trail 550 we were just talking about, um, and, and lots of other things. Um, uh, he's going to talk a bit about his uh, book that he has out called Big Rides and also some other projects he's been working on. Um, I have a suspicion that, that he is uh, motivated by, by two missions in life. The first mission is to get as many people as possible out riding their bikes in really cool places. And the second one, which he hasn't confirmed to me, but I don't think you would ever confirm it in public, is I think he wants to colour in the entire of Scotland on his commute map by riding on every single last centimetre of Scotland. Maybe he can confirm that or maybe he can't. Either way... I'll uh, switch off my video and microphone for now and let Marcus take over and then I'll see you guys at the end for the Q&A. Off you well, go, yeah. Marcus. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, I've just had a quick look through the, to the chat box. Hello to everyone. Um, quite a few people um, from, from very remote corners of the world. I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to start talking um, and give you a bit of a heads up. Um, there you go. I hope everyone can see that. So I'm, I'm going to talk um, more about the book. Um, it's a book I've co-authored last year. Um, it's called Big Whites, Great Britain and Ireland. Um, and give you some, some more personal stories, actually, from some of the routes in the book I've written. Um, um, first and foremost, the Highland Trail 550, um, which is one of the more hardcore rides in the book, um, and the John Muir Way, which is closer to my home in Edinburgh. Um, I'm based in Edinburgh since 12 years now, so a lot of my riding is in Scotland. Um, but I also want to take you um, a little bit into um, the book I'm working on at the moment, which is about gravel riding um, in Britain. It's a bit more out of Scotland. Um, and just give you some some ideas on that one as well. And also um, a very quick tease to a new bikepacking route I'm working on in Argyle. And at the very end, um, I'd really like to share a film with you, which I've been editing pretty much full, full, full guns blazing for the last three weeks, which is called Explore Your Boundaries. And it is a project um, I've done um, mostly during lockdown with Mark Beaumont, where we were sitting inside our homes in Edinburgh, um, getting a little bit bored by just 
being able to write um, within Edinburgh. And we mapped 24 different routes um, in councils um, all across Scotland and then wrote four of them. And the video is possibly a really interesting um, yeah, example of that big rides or any, any big expeditions don't have to be far afield. Um, um, I love going on adventures. Um, I love traveling as well, but it's also, I think one of the things I've taken away in the last two years is that adventure doesn't necessarily mean having to go somewhere. It can also start with your front door. So that's roughly, and then um, we hopefully have time for Q and A's afterwards as well. So hello to everyone. And I'm just going to have a quick look in the chat where people are coming from. I'm quite interested in that. Oh, that doesn't work. It's fine. <laughs> I'm just going to kick on. So Big Whites, that's the book. Um, we can post a link to the book as well. Um, it's been published by WorldPoint Publishing. Um, if you're thinking about buying it, I would recommend buying it straight from the publisher um, because in that way they get the most out of it and Amazon doesn't earn the bulk share of the book. So. Um, few things about me, um, if someone has to dive off beforehand, um, those are the three websites, which will tell you a little bit more. First one is my personal one. If you want to know a little bit more about my around the world trip, that's possibly the best place to go. Um, Bike Packing Scotland is um, a website I'm running since 2017 now, where most of the routes I've published in Scotland will be on. Um, it's a really good resource, hopefully, for if you're looking for bikepacking routes in Scotland. Um, and then Bikepacking Germany, it doesn't have too much content on at the moment, but it's another project I'm working on just to extend my reach a little bit. Um, I've mapped a route around the Iron Curtain, about 750 kilometers, which is on there. So if you're interested in that, um, have a look there. i give you a little bit of an intro to myself because I think um, that's it's quite good to know um, where I come from and where a lot of my adventures come from. And this is this is the Iron Curtain I was just talking about. Um, and this is where I grew up um, and, until I was 10 years old um, in East Germany. And people who have seen my work and um, possibly know a little bit more about me is that um, I think freedom goes through pretty much everything I'm doing. And I think this is this is the reason why, why this has been such a prominent feature in my life. Um, up until I was 10 years old, there was not there were not many places we could travel to um, and when that fence slash wall came down in 1989 that was like basically when the new chapter of my life started um, and ever since then I think like being able to go places and do things is the thing I valued the most not accumulating things somewhere I'm currently in Norway and I've just got a small suitcase with me um, so I can't even show you the book because I forgot to pack it but that's my childhood um, up, on, up until 10 years old. And then um, I could do things. And the first thing I did when um, I finished university was moving abroad um, and I moved to New Zealand. So hello to everyone um, from New Zealand. I had seen someone I was definitely um, watching from there. Um, and New Zealand is the country where I really um, started proper cycling. Um, up until then, I did mountain biking and I did a, a few longer trips as well. But New Zealand is where I really started backcountry riding, first on a mountain bike and then do cycle touring. And yeah, beautiful country to visit. Um, it's Scotland on steroids. Um, and from New Zealand, um, I went to Scotland. I moved there in 2009. I had lived in Scotland a number of summers beforehand working for the Fringe Festival. But um, this is a picture taken in 2014 when I, that was the first year when I started bikepacking. My first ever bikepacking experience was the Highland Trail 550. I'm going to talk about that in a few moments. Um, possibly one of the most hardcore bikepacking experience that there is in Scotland. Um, but um, yeah, ever since I started bikepacking in Scotland, I think I also made the decision that this is the country where I want to spend a foreseeable time in my life. So I'm still stuck there. Um, I live in Edinburgh um, and still do a lot of bikepacking over there. Um, and yes, I'm possibly trying to map quite a number of routes on Kamut, but I don't think I'll ever be able to do that fully in Scotland. Um, what came then, quite shortly afterwards, actually, in 2015, I left um, Edinburgh. I had mapped the Capital Trail, which was my first bikepacking route. 
And then I jumped on a single speed mountain bike and cycled 34,000 kilometers around the world. Um, I started on Portobello Beach in Edinburgh and I finished on Portobello Beach in Edinburgh and in between was the 26 countries. And it was a, it was a, um, a trip with loads of highs, some lows as well. Um, and it is also a trip that kind of made or triggered the decision that um, from when I came back to Edinburgh, I started working freelance. I'm a writer, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a photographer. Um, I've now um, yeah, tipped my toes into book, book writing as well. Um, and that was pretty much the result of the trip. Um, it was traveling to 26 different countries, um, meeting different people, experiencing different cultures, but also understanding how a cycle touring um, is valued in different countries. And that is very different. Um, there's countries which are really well developed. Um, for example, New Zealand is a good example for that. Um, Germany as well. Um, the UK is pretty good as well, um, but then there's countries like Australia, which possibly have a long way to go. Um, um, but those countries often also have different opportunities. That's the Nullarbor, um, one of the longest trade roads in the world you can find. And you can imagine cycling with one gear on such a long road is not an easy prospect. Um, and there's loads of thinking time as well. But it was a great trip and I don't want to delve too much into it, but um, I think this is something that that really shaped me as a person. And what shaped me as well were the last four days coming back to Scotland. Um, because I think if it's kind of poured home the idea that we've got so much fantastic cycling in the UK and in Scotland, and um, we don't shout about it um, that often. And I don't think we inspire as many people as we can in order to get on their bikes. And that was pretty much the triggering point where I decided I want to do more. Um, I want to map routes. Um, I want to tell people about some nice cycling opportunities. Um, and, and so I did. Um, I did a few other things since coming back from the Round the World trip. This is a project I did um, Nick Wax that was trying to cycle um, from Dover to Ben Nevis in three days and then another two days to Hull. Um, it's quite extreme, something between 350 and 400 kilometers a day. Um, so that's the extreme end of things. Um, there was another bike packing trip I did, um, cycling um, parts of the Silk Road in Kyrgyzstan and racing the Silk Road mountain race. Um, again, <laughs> an amazing country for cycle touring, but definitely not for the faint hearted. Um, and then before the pandemic hit, um, I became the first person to finish the Atlas mountain race um, on a single speed. Um, that stands because the race hasn't happened um, since. Um, so, um, yeah kind of really nice experience as well and definitely worthwhile experience in beer but a bit more about the book um what is big whites big whites is is basically a nice compilation of 25 different routes um to give you an idea what you could be doing in the uk um and i um yeah in the <clears throat> in the uk and ireland um or great britain and ireland um they are routes that are ranging from very different skill levels to very different lengths. Um, what it isn't, it, it's not a it's not a guidebook as such. Um, you'll get a good idea of the book, and I'll tell you a little bit about the information what you get. Um, and I've digged out this picture um, this morning. <laughs> I, I stumbled across it by by chance, to be honest with you. And I think in a way, um, this describes very well what the book is about. So it's it's not a book. Um, I think it's a book to inspire you. Um, and if you've done loads of long distance trips um, and you're an experienced cycle tour, uh, if you're an experienced bike packer, you get some lovely ideas, but you'll possibly come up with your own ideas on the back of that. If you're at the very beginning of your journey, um, then you'll get some great ideas as well, but you possibly just want to cycle a part of the route um, or do something which is close to home. And this is how my cycling journey in New Zealand began. And you can possibly sense totally unsuitable bike, totally unsuitable packing, don't even have cycling shoes. I've got a random bits of shorts and some sort of t-shirt. Um, but I had an amazing experience. And I think this is this is kind of like, I think Dick Wright is one of those books you can dive in and out every now and then, read a little bit about the roots and do some more research. Um, and, you know, at some stage, hopefully jump on your bike and do a trip. 
So those are the roots which are featured in the book. Um, I've co-authored the book with um, Katie Rogers. Um, I was basically mainly responsible for the roots I knew um, in Scotland. And I also did all the length and ascent and all the technical bits of the book as well um, and contributed a few pictures. And this is quite a handy thing in the book. So it's basically a title and this is kind of my main bit of work. It's kind of which listing all the routes um, gives you an idea um, where it is actually and which part of Great Britain or Ireland, um, what the distance is, um, the ascent, um, so how much you have to climb. Um, and that particular figure, so if you compare the length to the amount of climbing you need to do, that, give you, that will give you a good idea of how difficult the route is. Um, so something like the Highland Trail 550 is 884 kilometers with 13,000 meters of climbing. This is what I would suggest is quite an advanced route. Um, and then um, you get some trail icons as well, um, basically describing what is on the route. And then um, you've also got, and this is a suggestion, some people might want to extend or shorten this kind of the times when it's advisable to go um, to cycle the big ride. So a nice overview um, and the max minimum days, this is basically and, and the maximum minimum hours. Again, it's, 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 it's pretty much impossible to calculate a long distance route, how many hours you're gonna cycle it, how many days you're gonna cycle. It's just roughly to give you an idea what a very fit person would potentially do it in or someone who would want to take a little bit slower. I'm going to take you to mainly to two routes. Um, one of them, as I said before, and it's the Highland Trail 550, a route I know pretty much inside out because I've done the race three times, first time in 2014 on a single speed 26 inch mountain bike. Um, then the next time in 2015 as preparation for my round the world trip. And the last time in 2019, um, and although there isn't an official result, unfortunately for that one, that was the quickest time I've done it and possibly also the most hardcore time. It's a route um, which has just been completed by um, Annie Lee um, in winter, massive achievement, big congrats, um, something a lot of people thought is impossible to do and a few people had tried it beforehand. Super chuffed that she made it, um, conditions were tough. Um, it's definitely not a winter route for most of us, um, but it's doable. <laughs> um, it's a, it's, I think you can, it's, it's a route you can race. If you race it, um, you need to do it in seven days. Um, if you want to take it a little bit slower, then I would suggest it's something you can easily stretch over 14, not even longer than that, because there's plenty of stuff along the way. And especially if this is your only time in Scotland or you want a long holiday, there's, there's enough there's enough opportunity to extend it as well. It starts and finishes in Tintrum. And this is what you get in the book. So you get an overview map, um, you get the height profile, and then you get some essential information, kind of like so the essential information. And this is for all the routes, um, start and distance and essence, then how to get there rough guidance on time to complete, kind of some pros and cons for the route, um, variations, if there are any variation from the official route and some bits which are good to know and some further readings so where you can find the route. So the Highland Trail is a route where you need to make a small donation in order to get a GPX file. Um, it's not commonly available and the route differs sometimes as well. So the race route might be slightly different from what's described in the book. Um, but as I said, it's a suggestion and gives you an idea to do it. Um, the height profile, <laughs> you can possibly sense that it's not one of the easiest routes. It goes up um, quite significantly high, um, over 700 meters, which in the Scottish Highlands can be quite tricky weather. Um, in terms of suggestions, so the best time to travel is April, May, June, July. Um, that's basically main, mainly based on the fact that there will be midges and the stalking season. So this is something particularly um, for the routes in Scotland. Um, it's worth to consider um, that from August onwards, there will be stalking, um, which doesn't mean that you can't ride the routes, but you need to be a bit more careful and potentially live with that bits are closed 
normally any of the main tracks shouldn't be closed for stalking, um, but it's something that's definitely worthwhile considering. And also, if you ride any time after June, you'll be having to tackle Mitches, and Mitches on the Highland Trail are a pain in the neck. Um, you'll definitely encounter them. So that's my Highland Trail experience. I did the race in 2019 after having done it for twice already. And the reason I did it in 2019 was that I've done it in miserable conditions twice um, in 2014, 2015. And I did think that this is the year where the conditions are going to be great and I'm going to have this wonderful um, experience, no rain. Um, the two years beforehand were fairly dry, um, so there was not much um, rain beforehand. So that's all of us gathered. Um, the race starts in the end of May. Um, it's unfortunately full already, I think, um, and it's it has become pretty competitive in terms of getting in there. Um, but you can do an individual time trial as well if you want to do it timed or cycle the route on your own leisure pace. And it's one of those routes where I think a lot of the pictures you'll see from the Highland Trail is this typical Scottish massive open country landscapes um, wonderful scenery, which there's plenty. Um, this picture for me describes my experience in 2019, I think very precisely. This was my campsite on the second night, um, just before I went into one of the toughest section and the weather was horrendous. Easterly winds, it was raining really heavily during the day and in the evening. So I was soaked to the skin. Um, had a headwind. It was a very cold headwind um, due to the fact that it was an easterly. And <laughs> this was the luxury accommodation I treated myself to someone's private shed, um, which was somewhere close to the road. Um, I, in the morning, discovered that I had slept right underneath a fuel tank. So <laughs> I was a little bit dizzy when I woke up, um, trying my clothes on the bike. Um, so if you want to do the race, your experience will possibly at least at certain times be like this. Um, but it's a beautiful route. And the reason why I would suggest taking it a bit, bit easier, because it would be taken to some wonderful Scottish scenery. Um, and obviously, if you do it as a race, the time is cl the clock is ticking. So there is no real excuse to stop too long. I at least stopped for a couple of pictures in 2019 to capture some of those moments and I'm taking to, so this is this is um, um, the northern loop, so this is the bit that was added, um, um, originally the route was um, about 400 miles long, um, and then this bit was added, um, this takes you to some, to some really, really remote um, bits in the northeast of Scotland, um, and at times, and this is one of those routes where I would definitely recommend taking a mountain bike. Um, it's not a gravel route. It's certainly not a touring route because um, you'll at times encounter stuff like this. And you also need to be prepared to push your bike through block like this for two or three kilometers. So if you think that's acceptable and that's your idea of fun, then I would definitely recommend the Highland Trail. If you think that's not for you, then I would possibly stay clear of the route or do the bits which are which are a bit less hiker bikey. Um, that loop in the north is a lot of hiker bike in there. And there's also some <laughs> quite treacherous stuff there, depending on the weather. So this is the infamous um, river crossing um, in Fisherfield. Fisherfield is the most remote part of the route. Um, Fisherfield is just south of Olapool um, near Dundonald and basically you leave um, the road and then you're in the middle of absolutely no where um, I know the fastest way to do that bit in eight or nine hours um, although when I did it in 2019 there was a section along the shores of Loch Marie which for me already took about eight hours hike a bike to get through there so that year it was certainly longer than that time frame but that river crossing can be very tricky and this is something to check um, in general for the highland trail um, the reason why so many people dropped out in 2019 is that we had loads of heavy rain in the first couple of days and the rivers did go up quite significantly and it was 
yeah, um, it involved a, a lot, a lot of um, pushing across rivers, and it was possibly a bit too much for some people who are not used to riding in Scotland. I've lived in New Zealand for two years, so this is where I learned um, to cross a river. Um, it's impossible to do long distance route without crossing rivers in New Zealand, so that paid, um, yeah, in my favor a little bit. Um, but this is how deep it was um, in 2019. So you at least waist deep in the river, you have to wade over. It's not really a fast flowing river, but this section is possible possibly the make or break section for a lot of riders. Um, if you're doing it on a leisurely pace, there's a lovely boffy just before the river crossing. So um, you can stay a few days in there, but you're also very remote. So there's no cell phone reception. Um, there's not a shop. I think the nearest shop from there will be Isle Pool. So you have to carry quite a bit of food with you in order to stay there. So something, something to be mindful on the Highland Trail as well take at least stuff for an extra day just in case you get stuck somewhere so you don't run out of food. Um, and, and this shows you possibly a little bit how steep the route at times is. Um, so there's definitely not much riding involved going up here. Um, but Fisherfield, again, some, some amazing scenery. And, and even if the weather is as horrendous as in 2019, um, you'll possibly likely to encounter a break in the clouds every now and then and if that happens even if it's been raining for the whole day i think those are the moments you really only get in the scottish highlands um you possibly get them also in the mountains of wales um but if you're looking for that stuff the highland 12550 is a is a really good route some amazing lochs as well along the way so um as i said the most adventurous route in the whole book and i would definitely recommend if this is your first bike packing trip, it's doable. I'm not saying that it's not, but it's possibly something I've I would do once you've done a number of rides beforehand. Um, this is one of my favorite sections, um, and this will also be featured in my new travel book, actually, because of that. Uh, Klein Licht, um, that's um, one of the last more tricky sections. So this beautiful riding through that valley into towards Glen Afric. Um, then there's a really steep section. I don't have any pictures from that, unfortunately, because I was just too busy pushing my bike up there. Um, beautiful riding into, into the top of the clan. Then it's a very, very long hike bike section. And then there's a Buffy and um, the Clan Africa Youth Hostel. One of my highlights along the route, actually. And it's also one of those secret spots. If you want out of food, they always have a, have a healthy supply of stuff there as well. And... Once you see this, um, uh, there sometimes is the view towards Ben Nevis from there. That's Fort William. That's the majority of the of the big country riding done. Um, the last section, although on the West Highland Way, is still pretty tricky riding. You'll be going down the Devil's Staircase um, and then over Run Up Moor, um, over the old military road, which can be a bone shaker, especially if you're on a rigid bike like I was. It's another bit of advice. Um, I think the Highland Trail is definitely one of those routes where either a full suspension bike or front suspension will be will be an advantage or very wide tires that you've got a little bit of um, suspension in your tires. Um, it's definitely not a route where I would take um, thin tires um, and also take some, some rugged tires as well because there's quite a lot of rugged paths you need to go over. So that's the Highland Trail, um, 881 kilometers of pretty much mountain biking across the Highlands of Scotland. If you're looking for another interesting Scottish experience and possibly on the very different end of the spectrum, that's the John Muir Way. And it's a, it's a route um, I've known pretty much since I, um, since I moved to Edinburgh. Um, and um, it's one of those routes where a lot of my everyday riding around Edinburgh actually includes at least a short section of the John Muir Way. That's why I was, I was quite chuffed when I was commissioned to do a film about the John Muir Way. Um, it's a 209 kilometer route. There's three different versions of it. There's the walking route, there's the cycling route, um, and then there's a bikepacking route as well. So the bikepacking route is what um, I've devised in 2020. Um, it's basically a combination of the cycling and the walking route. Um, there's some bits um, on the walking route that are not cyclable because they're going over ancient monuments. 
Um, but pretty much else is, is in the bikepacking route, which is on the walking route as well. Um, the cycling route is slightly different, takes a different approach in the first part of the journey. Um, that's more designed for people who cycle with panniers, um, which is definitely doable on the cycle route. 209 kilometers. I would suggest riding it from the west to the east just because of the prevailing wind direction. But again, this can be, I would possibly suggest looking at the wind. Um, it's not a super exposed route, so you won't have massive difficulties, but especially the last bit, which goes to East Lothian, um, can be quite tricky if you have a headwind. Um, it's mainly flat, um, but if you have a headwind there, it can possibly not as fun. Um, but normally the wind comes from the west if you ride this thing. And I think this picture describes the John Muir way really well. It's a, it's a route you can do um, if you want to have a super challenge, you can do it in a day. Um, I would suggest taking it easy because um, it's a lovely route. There's so much stuff along the route. Um, there's loads of food, there's loads of train stations, so you can break it up into various different little bits as well if you want to, especially if you're based around Edinburgh, Glasgow, and you've got a ride on your doorstep. Um, and there's loads of places. This is a meadow just before um, between um, Durleton and North Berwick. Um, there's some amazing places where you can just literally sit in the grass, especially if you ride it in summer, look up to the sky and enjoy yourself. And I think this is very much what, why it's called the John Muir Way. Um, the association with John Muir is basically he was born in Dunbar. Um, and that's where the name comes from. Along the route, there isn't really much that has a lot to do with John Muir, but I think it's it's about the experience, the countryside. And I'll take you, I've got some images, and this is mainly shot when I when I documented it. There is a film called Unhur Unhurried. If you're interested, there was my take on a John Muir way. Um, it's a very slow film um, um, and possibly, hopefully, inspire you to take it easy. This is the start in Helen's book. Um, um, this is um, um, an artwork um, which has um, um, famous words from John Muir written in it. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You can find that out when you do the route yourself. Um, Helensburg, small town in Argyll, um, lovely place. Um, there are now quite a number of day journeys of the John Muir Way, which are listed on the John Muir website or will be in the near future. So again, if you want to make it a longer holiday, I would suggest cycling the main route and then doing those day trips to extend it a little bit. Um, and it takes you all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast. Um, that's the finish of the John Muir Way, John Muir's birthplace in Dunbar. Um, nice, nice little museum, very interesting exhibition in there um, and very friendly staff as well. Just be aware, the open, uh, check the opening times beforehand. Um, and then Dunbar, Dunbar is one of those places, the same like Helensburg. It's a bit of a hidden gem. It's it's not a town which is which is super touristy. Um, Dunbar, um, yeah, there's some there's some nice places to stay, there's some nice places to eat, but you'll also get a very authentic Scotland experience and not not the super touristy experience that you might get on the Isle of Skye or the North Coast 500 or other routes which have become very popular. I think Dunbar is unlikely to get super crowded, um, neither is Helen's birth. So, and this, this is what I love about the route. And it will take you to Scotland's central belt um, where loads of the people in Scotland live, but it's also got pockets of nature in there, which are where you can feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Um, some, um, it's, there's very few very wild places, but then there's hardly any wild places left if you look at the definition of wildland in Scotland. Um, but you definitely get a sense for that. Um, you can do some tree hugging as well. There's some lovely stretches. This is the bit um, between Blackness Castle and South Queensferry, one of my favorite rides in Scotland, I would suggest. Um, um, very interested, um, not many hills, um, very chilled, um, and some lovely countryside. Um, those are some, some windswept trees on um, Yellow Craig um, Beach um, near Durleton um, on your North Berwick on that section of the route in East Lothian. Um, and generally some, 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 some great countryside, some great wildlife as well. Um, and that was what I was trying to get across in Unhurried. Um, it's a route 
that invites you to stop and just sit somewhere for five minutes. And there's there's some lovely wildlife reserve. Um, Abu Lady Bay um, is what I would recommend. Um, you'll definitely find something. Then there's a section um, just after Masaba um, where you go along the coast and there's loads and loads of birds along that section. There's also bits like the Union Canal um, where you'll find um, some interesting, yeah, and even it's just swans or ducks or whatever is floating around in the water. I think it's, it's there's loads to see. There's some big, big um, um, scenery there as well. The East Lothian Coast has some stunning beaches. Um, some of them are a little detour off the route. Um, so I would definitely suggest on the bit in East Lothian to explore a little bit further. Um, places like Bass Rock, um, which are worth for an excursion by boat. So you can't cycle there, but you can take a boat from the Scottish Seabird Centre um, in North Berwick. And there's some interesting architecture along the route as well. And I think this is what makes the John Muir Way quite unique because you've got routes like the Highland Trail 550, which are a lot of amazing scenery, um, but not much in the ways of settlements or architecture along the way. And the John Muir Way is quite different. Um, the bridge to nowhere um, in Belhaven Bay, um, places like the Falkirk Wheel, um, very interesting if you're, if you're into um, architecture or construction. Um, then there's the old steamer, um, which is currently, I think, being still um, refurbished and made into a museum, but I think you can explore it already. Um, I don't know exactly because I didn't have time to do that. Um, and then the Avon um, Aqueduct, uh, second longest one in the UK. Um, no cycling there, you need to push your bike over so you can enjoy the scenery. And then places like historic places like Tantalan Castle on the East Lothian coast and towns like Dunbar, there's some, there's some lovely architecture as well. So as I said before, and John Muir Way, um, I think for me, the best of both worlds um, and definitely enjoyable. Um, in terms of riding surface, if you do the bikepacking route, um, the bits in the east are there's some lovely sections on really nice wide um, gravel tracks. This is the sections um, section around Burn Cooks Reservoir, and this is where the cycle touring route and the bikepacking route slash walking route um, differ. So the cycling touring route will take you a, a different way. Um, the walking route takes you past Burn Cooks Reservoir. And this is what I've adapted in the bikepacking route as well. Um, and then there's also some, some lovely sections in East Lodian, which are off-road as well. Um, they are fine to cycle um, on a touring bike. I would possibly suggest for some of the sections in the rest, it's good to have a gravel bike and some more quibby tires, but in the majority of times you'll be okay um, with a touring bike on that route. And some great cycle paths as well. Um, no cars, no, very, very few other people. This is the section along um, the coast from Blackness Castle again to South Queens Ferry. Um, and no, hold on, I was wrong. This is the section beforehand, um, before you get to Blackness Castle, some fantastic riding there, um, taken by the drones. So you might not be able to recognize that beach when you cycle along it. Um, a few other routes, which I'm just going to quickly skim over. Um, Great North Trail um, is another really interesting route um, in the book. Um, it does overlap um, quite, quite a lot with the GB Divide as well, which is the route which is um, used for GB Duo, if you heard about that one. Um, takes you um, from the middle of England, roughly, um, up to either K. Braff or John O'Groats. Um, and I know the section in Scotland quite well. Um, there's some fantastic riding that, so definitely um, another mountain bike slash gravel bike route. I think this is fine on a gravel bike, um, although you have some technical riding in there as well. Um, again, some, some fantastic big open country. So um, if the Highland Trail is a bit too much in your eyes, then I would possibly suggest looking at the Great North Trail. It's possibly a good alternative to that or the GBD ride route. Um, it's got some cracking places. This um, is the Koryarik Pass, which is featured on the Highland Trail 550 as well. Um, the notorious slash infamous switchbacks um, 
possibly very difficult to write from this slide. Um, quite quite loose and technical, um, but definitely when you come to the top, you've got a long descent down to Fort Augustus, which doesn't seem to end. Um, very midgy in summer, but if you get a good day on the Koweyarek, it's fantastic. Um, this is the section um, in the north, um, north of Garf, um, in the Aladea Wildlife Reserve, I think it's called. Um, basically, there's a long off-road section which takes you to the middle of the Scottish Highlands. Um, again, some fantastic scenery there. And that's about it. And another route which is featured, I think, um, the very famous British Royal Lands End to John O'Quotes. Um, um, the route described in there, it's, it's, it's that journey where I think everyone I know has taken a different route. There's people um, who um, do it very fast. There's people who take a long time. I did it uh, myself on a single speed bike in five and a half days. So that's pretty racy. Um, and fantastic scenery again, um, the Cornwall Coast. I um, think to get a good impression of what Britain is all about in terms of riding and also get a really nice idea of the various landscapes, lands and the John O'Quotes, for me still is the most iconic journey. Um, John O'Quotes, personal opinion is a little bit disappointing, so I wouldn't put too many hopes in there when you arrive there. Um, there's not much there, um, but if you get a lovely um, sunrise like this, when I, this is, was taken when I documented GB Dogo on a bicycle, um, some fantastic moments along the route, and you can do it in Mary Reds. Um, I, I followed Mark Bowman and Hank from GCN when they tried to break the record on the tandem um, doing the journey, um, or trying to do it, I think, in less than 48 hours. Um, they didn't succeed doing it, but that gives you an idea how quick it can be done. Um, you can also do it off-road. Um, that's what GB Duo does. So GB Duo is a race um, in August, um, which has a no-fly policy, so you can only do it if you get to the start, either by train, by car, so any means with, which don't include an, um, an aeroplane. Um, <coughs> really interesting route. Um, the majority of GB2 is still on the road, so doing a complete off-road journey lands and the journal codes, I, I would suggest, is mission impossible. Um, but there are some big chunks of road as well. So if you, after doing the journey um, on a mixed surface thing, then I would suggest having a look into the GBD white route. And other routes included in Scotland, North Coast 500, um, I guess pretty well known. Um, my suggestion with that one is if you're attempting to do it, then I wouldn't suggest doing it in peak season just because of availability. Um, of accommodation and it can get pretty busy in terms of traffic as well. I'm currently working with the North Coast 500 to come up with an idea how you can do the route by public transport and just doing sections of the North Coast 500. Um, so that's a work in progress and it's going to get published uh, in about May time if you're interested in that. And um, to take you a little bit away from the book as well and kind of into the into the bigger team of big rides. Um, there's plenty of other places in Britain um, you can ride and which are not featured in the book. Um, but I think if you if you have a look in the book, that will hopefully inspire a little bit more research. I'm working on a bikepacking route at the moment um, over the Argyle Islands. The Hebridean Way is featured in the book, um, but is another one of those routes that has become very, very popular. Um, I wouldn't say it's getting crowded, um, but you'll encounter definitely more people there. The route I'm working on in Argyle is, is definitely a much quieter route, which will take you over places like Jura. This is captured on Jura. And um, the new route I'm working on is, again, similar concept to GB Dubo. So there's a, there's a good chunk on the road, but there's also a good chunk on gravel tracks. Um, with some amazing beaches as well. This is taken in Mull. Um, Oban is about the best accessible place at the moment in terms of getting there by train. It's the only train in Scotland that takes up to 20 bikes. Um, and is also, to my knowledge, the only train where you can actually take a tandem or a cargo bike on from Glasgow to Oban. So it's definitely worthwhile looking into that as an option. 
um, some fantastic scenery around co um, around the coast um, of those islands. So this route will include Mull, Jura, Isla, and Butte, and then um, quite a chunk on the mainland to get from Oban to Taiwa, like to take the ferry over to Jura. So watch out for that um, in the near future. And the other project um, I quickly going to take you into is, is the book, which is coming out, um, is scheduled to come out in July. Um, it's called Great British Gravel Rides. And that was, it's my first own book. I, as I said, I co-authored Big Rides together with Katie. Um, this, this is the book where I've done all the research myself. And the idea of that book is, is, is possibly a very different one from the Big Rides book. Um, um, it's also meant to be a kind of a coffee table book to inspire you. Um, but what I've done in the book is to feature 25 different people that ride gravel bikes. And the definition of a gravel bike is very loose. Um, a gravel bike, I think most people, when they think of gravel bikes, they think about drop bars, they think about 700 C-reels, possibly 40 millimeter tires. Um, my definition of a gravel bike is, is much broader um, because Britain has a very long tradition of off-road riding, which pretty much started before the Rough Stuff Fellowship and then went all the way through. So people have always been riding off-road in the last 100 years. And that was kind of what I took as a starting point for the book. Um, I was also very keen to have an almost equal ratio of men and women in the book. Um, and also um, featuring people of color as well, just to simply inspire as many people as possible. Um, the rides in the book are going to be from 20 kilometers up until um, 500 kilometers, no, 600 kilometers is the longest ride actually. And the format is, is basically, um, I spent a lot of time riding. So I met 25 different people who then took me around their favorite routes um, that could either be where they live. Um, in some cases, it was also where their first riding was. So again, the definition wasn't really tight on this one. And it was a fantastic project to work on getting to know those people. And the book's gonna be a portrait of the person and then a portrait of their favorite route. Um, and we'll give you information about cafes, um, a route descriptions, what are the places along the route you should be stopping or that could inspire you to stop. So it's an interesting project. Um, some people which are featured, um, this is Dalia. Um, she's a um, gravel rider based in London. Um, Emma Ossington, um, based in Hepton Bridge. Um, Hepton Bridge is possibly one of the hilliest places in the whole of the Britain to ride a bike because it's a rally. You need to get out of the rally pretty much in each direction. It's a lot of climbing in there. Um, Rory Hitchens um, from Kinesis Bikes, one of the people who's been very influential getting gravel bikes into the UK or what is now sold as a gravel bike by the industry since 2014. Um, and it's also got some, some, some places like the Monega Pass um, for the people um, who live in Scotland or have been riding a lot in Scotland. Um, this is possibly one of the trickiest gravel routes you can do in the whole of Britain. It's a bit like the Highland Trail in a mini format. Um, um, but if you look at that picture, it's got some fantastic writing. So that's also the idea behind the book. Um, there are some technical sections in there and some, possibly some sections in there where I've used travel as the broadest definition you can find. Um, but that's the idea behind the book, again, to inspire you. And some stuff in the Peak District as well. But, this is Stefan from Pannier CC, another website I, I really like. It's got some lovely information as well. Um, and last bit of my talk before I show you the film and then we can um, hopefully yeah, go to some Q&As. Just some ideas, because um, I think um, where to look for a big ride, just to give you some pointers. So. Um, in Scotland, there's a wonderful resource called Heritage Paths. And um, for pretty much every wood planning project I've done in the last five years, I've consulted this website first as a free resource. Um, it's also a wonderful resource if you're into maps. Um, if you're a map geek, you'll find maps um, of different formats from different years um, on the website. And that lists all the historic paths in Scotland, Trovers routes, military roads. 
Um, so if you're looking to do your own big white, I would highly recommend looking into that. Um, I haven't found such a resource for um, England and Wales, but um, if anyone knows of that, I'd be really interested in, in, in the pointers getting there. And um, Heritage Path is possibly also a good example how, how I often plan my rides. So history for me is quite an important part of all my journeys. Um, most of the routes I've, I've designed um, for bikepacking Scotland um, and also the Iron Curtain Gravel Trail were basically um, using history as a pointer just to um, either track paths from the Trovers, there's loads of them in Scotland. Um, there's a fantastic book by Helding called, called The Twelve Roads of Scotland. So if you want some inspiration, I'd recommend doing that. There's some Roman roads. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff I found out when doing the research for the Crabble book. Roman roads, there's plenty of them in Britain. Um, some of them have disappeared. Some of them have, tarmac, have been tarmacked over. Some of them still exist in a mixed format, like Deer Street, for example, the sections which are now tarmac. Some sections you'll be very hard pushed to ride your bike on them. There's some, and then there's some wonderful sections where to ride a bike. So I would recommend looking into those different sources, ask friends, ask people you know. There's some fantastic videos um, online as well. I've seen, I think Barry Godin was, um, I've seen his name. Um, he's done some fabulous videos as well to inspire you so i would i would yeah i would recommend um just trying <clears throat> and a big ride can also be a 50 kilometer ride it doesn't have to be 250 kilometers i think for me the definition and it's the same definition i've used for the upcoming gravel book um i think an adventure can be anything and this is also um like the last bit um the film i'm going to show you i'm uh, a bit of history to to what mark and i have done so we're both around the world cyclists mark beaumont um has cycled in less than 80 days around the world um he's done some amazing expeditions and imagine two people who've been to quite a few corners of the world who've been then told um you have to stay at home we, we were still able to ride our bikes and the definition of where you could ride your bikes in lockdown in scotland was actually quite broad because as long as your start journey started within your council boundary or five miles out with of that, then you were fine to start your journey from there. And that basically triggered the question for both me and Mark, where does Edinburgh actually extend to? We had no idea. You'll see, you, you, you see the, the signs on the road, welcome to the city of Edinburgh. Um, but I've never consciously actually thought about where does the city of Edinburgh end? Where does Midlodian, East Lodian, and all the other Lodians which are around Edinburgh start? So we've downloaded the council boundaries um, in Scotland as GPX files, uploaded them onto Komoot, matched them to the nearest pathways or to the nearest wide route we thought might be rideable on a gravel bike, um, and used that to have an adventure, really. Um, um, as with any route mapping project, things on the map sometimes look very different to what reality is like. Um, and the weather conditions can make a huge difference. And we started doing that with riding the boundary of Edinburgh on the 2nd of January, 2021. And really just to kind of kick off our year with an adventure, that was basically our intention doing so. It was roughly about 115 kilometers, I think we did in the end. Um, there was a lot of sections pushing our bikes in there. Um, because it also had snow just on the morning when we set off. Um, there was a big blizzard for about an hour or so. So we had a really nice white coating across everything. Um, and this journey then inspired us to um, map um, more routes. So we ended up mapping 24 routes, actually. Um, they are all available on the Bikepacking Scotland website. Um, you'll find the section explore your boundaries and then you'll find the collection or you can go on my Komoot profile as well or Mark's Komoot profile they're featured on both and yeah so we, we we kind of then started started this exercise of mapping as many council boundaries as possible and we had um the we had another 25th sent in um by Craig from Aberdeen who helped us with that and it was really it's it was an it was a fantastic exercise to do because a um both of us got to know the Scottish Council a little bit better. 
And it was exactly the bits um, that weren't the tourist hotspot that interested us. And so we ended up cycling the boundary of um, East Lothian, um, Clark Manager, which is one of the smallest ones, um, Falkirk. And um, then we got challenged by, or not challenged, but inspired very much by a journalist from the Scotsman, Alistair Dalton, who's the transport correspondent, who said to us, um, Are you? Uh, could you do another one? Could you do Glasgow as well? And um, it fitted quite nice with COP26. So we wrote COP, um, the boundary of Glasgow during COP26. Um, and we camped in Glasgow and, and possibly gives you an idea. Like I would have never, ever thought about an overnight trip for two days um, around the periphery of Scotland's biggest city. And we had an amazing adventure. I just want to show you this film. Um, it's gonna um, come out in public next Tuesday, so if you like it, it will be online from Tuesday eight o'clock onwards um, on my YouTube channel. Yeah, and I hope um, yeah you're enjoying it. I'm just gonna quickly bring up the video. <laughs> 